Today we're going to talk about the lymph system. We're going to review the anatomy and physiology. We'll talk about clinical examination and differential diagnosis and the diagnostic tools that we have to make a diagnosis. So when we look at the function of the lymph system, it is essentially a network of vessels, very similar to those of blood vessels, that are going to be carrying white blood cells and lymphatic um, fluid to help fight infection. Um, the lymph system provides uh, transportation of, of fluid um, to drain fluid from body tissues. And essentially our lymph nodes are gland-like masses that allow us to um, receive this fluid. And then with the utilization of the white blood cells, it helps to destroy the bacteria and toxins that are found in this fluid. Now, when we look at lymphadenopathy, there are some differences between age groups. For example, in children, lymphadenopathy is seen more commonly with infectious um, processes. And most often they are seen, lymphadenopathy is seen due to infectious processes. So it's relatively common and often benign. However, when we have lymphadenopathy, we need to do a good history and physical to identify some possible red flags because children can include other um, causes of lymphadenopathy such as autoimmune issues and malignancies. Now adults over the age of 40 are at higher risk for malignancies. So lymphadenopathy for someone under the age of 40 may be more benign, um, but those over 40 uh, are exponentially more at risk for malignancies. And you should be suspicious um, with elevated lymph or enlarged lymph nodes in older adults. Men are also at higher risk for malignancies, uh, more so than women. Um, and uh, Caucasians um, as a race are also at higher risk for uh, malignancies. So in order to develop our differential diagnosis, we need to look at um, a variety of things. So when we're taking our history, it's important to find out what is the cause of the lymphadenopathy. So has the child or the adult had an infectious process that's been going on for a period of time? Or is there no known etiology? The patient just developed these nodes and we need to investigate further. When we talk about history, we need to make sure that we look at exposures. Um, environmental exposures, whether it be from contact with patients with tuberculosis, and now they have a lymphadenopathy um, because of um, tuberculosis infection. Or um, what was their occupation? You know, if they worked, you know, 20, 30 years in a mining facility, um, they may have some lymphadenopathy from some of the exposures that they've been to in, the, in, that, in those industries. And don't forget um, smoking history, because that can include malignancies, as well as sexual history. Um, HIV and syphilis both can present with lymphadenopathy. Um, you want to know if there's any family history. There are certain illnesses such as leifer fromini syndrome and lipid storage diseases that are associated with lymphadenopathy. Again, you want to know how long it's been going on. Um, lymphadenopathy that's pretty short in course or short duration, um, maybe due to an infectious process, but lymphadenopathy that's been going on for several months may be more suspicious for malignancies. Um, location. Location is super important. Supracavicular nodal enlargement um, is important to identify, also known as Virchow's node. Um, these are commonly associated with abdominal malignancies, um, and in some cases up to 50 to 75 percent. So it can be very significant if you find these sort of lymph nodes. Um, lymph nodes in the axillary region um, can be suspicious for other types of malignancies like lymphomas, breast cancers, lung cancers, um, just to name a few. Breast implants um, can cause um, lymphadenopathy due to a reaction from the silicone. So it's also important to ask if they've had any type of plastic surgeries. Um, inguinal um, lymph nodes that are enlarged um, may be correlated to different sexually transmitted diseases, um, but you should also have a concern and suspicion for malignancies. Now our physical exam, we wanna be thorough. We wanna be able to assess all the lymph nodes in their chains, where they drain, we want to be able to describe their characteristics, evaluate your patient's appearance. You know, does this patient walk into your office toxic looking or do they look relatively healthy 
um, and just have presentation of lymph nodes. And you want to be complete. You want to be able to assess the head, the neck, the axillary region, and your inguinal areas for lymphadenopathy. You want to be able to describe your lymph node um, and the location of which to where they drain. Um, you want to look at the skin around the lymph node. Are there lesions? Are there tracts? Um, is there any noted trauma to that area? And when describing the nodes, you want to identify their size. Um, very large lymph nodes, greater than two centimeters, can be very suspicious for malignancies. Um, um, are they painful or non-painful? Um, are they localized in one side of the body or are they diffuse um, all over an entire region? When I talked about the red flags, these are some of the red flags that you need to be concerned for um, to further investigate, especially those for a malignant uh, type of lymphadenopathy. So supraclavicular, I've already mentioned with Virchow nodes, um, can be indicative of abdominal malignancies. Large lymph nodes, greater than two centimeters. Um, are they fixed to a position or to a structure? Um, does the patient present with weight loss greater than, uh, uh, greater, greater than 10%? Um, on chest x-ray, do we see masses? Um, patients with uh, uh, lymphomas can have very large uh, masses within the chest. <clears throat> Night sweats, progressive enlargement of the lymph node, as we see in the picture here, um, or do they have persistent fevers? We also want to look at other organ involvement. You know, when we look at the chest and our chest x-ray, you know, do we have a mediastinal mass from a lymphoma? And does it cause compression on other structures, such as the SVC? Some of these patients may even come in with facial swelling. Small children may look like their entire head is swollen with SVC syndrome. We want to assess their respiratory status. Do they have an increased work of breathing? Are they short of breath? And in the abdomen, you know, do they have a hepatosplenomegaly? Do they have a large abdominal mass and ascites? These are all important factors when evaluating um, not just the lymph system, but also for lymph nodes. These next three slides um, give you position of all your different chains of lymph nodes. And they also give you uh, identification of um, a different differentials you may have as far as malignancies. So for example, when we look at the pre nodes, they drain into the scalp, into the skin. Your differential diagnosis could be a scalp infection or it could be a mycobacterial infection. But also you may need to rule out, are there, is there a skin malignancy? Are there lymphomas? Do we have a head and a neck squamous cell carcinoma. So take a look at the next few slides um, and look at the different positions of these nodes and where you would see enlargement, identify where they drain, and then look to see if you can come up with a differential list if you met a patient like that in clinic. These are the axillary nodes and these are the inguinal nodes. One thing I found to be helpful is the Miami mnemonic. And when you look at a, the Miami mnemonic, it's going to help you identify um, what could be the cause of these of the lymphadenopathy. So, for example, M stands for malignancies. Is this a lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? Is this a leukemia? When we look at infections, there's a long list. I only listed a few here. Um, if you look into the readings, there's a pretty good list of different types of infection. But TB um, is one thing to worry about. Bartonella, also known as cat scratch fever, um, could be another um, infection to look at. Typhoid fever, primary and secondary syphilis. Um, also important to note if the patient has had their immunizations, um, because some patients nowadays that aren't being immunized may come in with mumps and come and present with the lymphadenopathy. Autoimmune diseases such as lupus or any type of connective tissue like Sjorgen syndrome or rheumatoid arthritis can present with lymphadenopathy. Then there's the miscellaneous group, those that fit different, um, different disease process, like Kawasaki's, which is a vasculitis, um, or sar sarcoidosis. And then there can be those uh, patients that present with lymphadenopathy that are um, iatrogenic or responsive to medications. So certain drugs, and again, the literature that I provided offers a, a more exhaustive list but there are some medicines such as atenolol, captopril, integritol, penicillin, and dilantin can, uh, can present with a lymphadenopathy. I found this decision tree to be quite helpful. So when you're looking at, after you've done your Miami mnemonic, you've done your history and physical, 
you've looked at your patient, you've identified where your lymphadenopathy is, you've gone through your Miami mnemonic. Now you can take the evaluation of lymphadenopathy to help you guide you through what studies you need to do. So for example, if my patient presented with um, a lymph node that I was concerned for malignancy, say we had a 47-year-old male that came in um, with swollen lymph nodes in the supraclavicular region, um, I may offer that patient a needle biopsy or a lab work to identify some of the needs for that patient to make a diagnosis and to help start or guide treatment. Um, other patients that may be unexplained, as you can see here on the list, may have a more uh, exhaustive type of workup, but at least you can delve, dive in deeper to find out what these causes are. And you may have cross, you know, I mean, you may have a patient that you're both, you know, suspicious of malignancy and autoimmune disease based on your physical history and physical, and you may have to kind of um, work them up a little bit further. But I definitely would look at the decision tree and utilize it as a guide. Now, I did take this same diagram and I created it as a PDF, which is going to be located in your readings, and you can utilize this with you in clinic if you need it um, as a reference. So let's look over some of the labs that we would, um, you know, identify. Um, we would have uh, obviously a CVC. With the CVC, we're going to evaluate not just the white count, but we also want to look at the differential. We want to look at to see, you know, you know, do we have um, uh, the different types of white cells that we have? Um, you know, do we have uh, our neutroph? You know, uh, you know, very are we producing a lot of um, segs and bands? Um, what are our lymphocyte percentages? Those kind of things. Um, the white cell count can help you diagnose some of your different types of leukemias, um, but you may also have some other information within the CVC that can help guide therapy. Obviously, our cultures um, would be helpful, along with um, swabs. You know, if we had a thought culture and we're worried about infection, um, and those would be helpful um, studies as well. When we look at our lactate dehydrogenase or our LDH will help us identify the turnover of the white blood cell, like how fast um, we're getting rid of and producing these cells. But an elevated level does not necessarily rule in malignancy. So it's more so of a marker or something to assess trends. <clears throat> um, serologies are definitely very important and they can include a multitude of different types of testing, whether it be looking for Epstein's Barr virus, the Bartonella, Lyme disease, tuberculosis, mycobacterium, but it also can, you know, uh, be utilized in testing for HIV, um, different um, uh, ANA testing for those patients that you're concerned with lupus. Um, there's different um, variety of testing that we may need to identify. Some of that may be uh, found on the history. Some of it may be found on your physical exam. When we look at imaging, super important. Um, chest x-ray will let you identify um, nodes or masses in the chest. Um, it'll also help identify potential complications such as compression of large vessels, SVC, IVC, compressions of the lung if the patient is tachypneic or having uh, respiratory difficulties. Ultrasound is a, is a, is a well-utilized tool, especially in children, um, it's, you know, considering the fact that it is uh, non-invasive or it's less invasive than doing a biopsy um, or doing other studies such as a CT scan. Um, in some cases with children, you know, we have to intubate those patients, sedate them to get a good thorough study. Um, so to use ultrasound as a tool is very helpful. It does not differentiate between uh, benign or malignancy, but it can help you identify certain types of um, elevations. Um, the rates can be um, false positives and false, false, neg false negatives are relatively high. Um, so we need to consider that when we're using ultrasound in these patients. CT scan is very helpful to identify location um, and to look at images that you may not see on the x-rays or the ultrasound. And one of the most helpful and definitive studies would be using a fine needle biop biopsy. We can send these off for cytology and histology. Um, they're easy to do. Um, they have a relatively high accuracy. 
up to 90%. Their specificity is 85 to 95%, sensitivity 98 to 100%. Um, these can be extremely helpful. Excision biopsies are a little bit more invasive because you're actually removing the node, um, but this may be a helpful resource or helpful tool to use for patients that don't want a multitude of different studies being done. Thank you very much. That's the end of my lecture. No, I just erased the whole damn thing. That sucks. You, know, you uh, Jessica, I'm sure you don't mind. Pleasure to meet you. You with Tony?